Your final author is an award-winning, internationally best-selling author and journalist. She is the author of New York Times bestseller. Again, I don't know what that is. <laughs> bestseller, If I Stay, uh, Where She Went, Just One Day and Just One Year. And most recently, her new novel, I Wish... Uh, excuse me, her new novel, I Was Here. No, she will never put a fourth word in a book title. <laughs> She's made up her mind, folks. You stick. Wait, what? You yeah, know. Her book titles are tweets. Okay. She will be telling a story integrating many tweets crowdsourced from her Twitter followers. Please welcome Gail Foreman, everybody. <laughs> writers here and I think writers all know that the hardest part of the job is the blank page when we're starting a new work yeah yeah exactly and that's why Twitter is so handy because you can put that off for like hours and hours and days and days and, and months and months if you want um, but it also turns out it's handy because you can get your followers to to write the first line of your stories for you as I found out and as Anna found out um, so I I'm like hey Twitter followers uh, can you how about you guys write me the first line of a story I'm like oh, I'm so clever that's like 140 characters I don't have to come up with myself I am a genius um, and then I got so many tweets, I thought, well, what if I have them like write all bits of the story? Like, what if I use 20 tweets? That would be like 140 characters, like, well, you know, times 20. I'm a writer. I'm not gonna do that math for you. You guys can use it on your phones. So this is what I came up with. You will see the tweets as they appear in the story up there on the magic screen. And, um, and I will read you the story. Also, I feel this story answers a question I get a lot in the real world and on Twitter, which is, Gail, are you ever going to write something that's not contemporary? Well, this is my debut right here, right now, into fantasy fiction. <laughs> and so we begin. Ready? First opening line, here we are. I always expected to be saved by my knight in shining ar armor, so you can imagine how startled I was when it was the dragon because I'd never really considered a dragon before. I mean, I know it had become less taboo since one of the Kardashians started dating one on TV, but <laughs> I hadn't really thought of one for me. It's not that I'm sheltered, I'm from Brooklyn, and I've had a boyfriend before, jerk, but I was just wary of hot guys and fire-breathing anything. And also, call me snobby, but I have a thing about oral hygiene. I feel like it's a sign of self-respect and Dragon Beth, we have all heard the stories. But I was in a low place. We just moved from Park Slope, Brooklyn, to Oak Park, Chicago, which I know people say is the same, but is totally not. <laughs> Moving from Brooklyn to Chicago was the last thing in my wish list. I hated the wishing fairy for his poor granting decisions. <laughs> there is no wishing fairy, my mom said. My mom was always saying things like that. She is like a total buzzkill. She's like the opposite of a wish-granting fairy. <laughs> so anyhow, I was in bed feeling sorry for myself when I was wakened by the flapping of my window shutters. I remember the last time I woke up in a startle. <laughs> I won two tickets to a Miley Cyrus concert and I didn't know what to do. I still think about that because I knew I should have taken my boyfriend, Richie, but he was always saying how hot Miley was, how he wanted to get with her, so I didn't want to go with him. I should have dumped him then. He was such a skeeve. I heard the flapping again. I looked out the window. No one was there. I went outside. It was deserted. I thought to myself, I don't know anyone who lives in this neighborhood, so why am I standing here at 2 a.m. in the cold without a coat? And that's when I saw him swooping around the sky, blowing giant flame bubbles. What a show off. I pretended not to care. I mean, yeah, we had a few bra uh, dragons in Brooklyn, but not in Park Slope. The rents were too high, and there'd been a few high-profile brandstone fires, and now landlords refuse to rent to them. The Times did a big story about it that they made us read in school last year, but Oak Park was more progressive, I guess. 
The dragon glided to a stop in front of me and said, what if we don't exist and we're just part of someone else's imagination? I rolled my eyes and crossed my arms. Let me tell you a story on how I predicted my death, I told him. Which I thought was a pretty sassy, op sassy opening line for meeting a dragon because everyone knows how dangerous they are. He quirked an eyebrow. Clearly, he thought I was going to say something about being ravaged by a big, bad, fire-breathing dragon, which was exactly what I wanted him to think. Then I said, I die of boredom because someone tries the lamest pickup line on me. He stared at me. Maybe this works on Chicago girls, but I'm from 718. He kept staring at me, and I started to feel uncomfortable and said, 718, the area code in Brooklyn? Then he said, for what it's worth, I tried to unlock your enigmatic happiness. <laughs> what did I just say about the cheesy pickup lines? Some people will give up when the going gets rough, but me, I choose to fly. <laughs> Do you always talk like that? But he was doing that shimmery thing with his scales. I knew what he was offering, and I wanted to say yes. But I knew the rules with guys. I figured they applied to dragons, too. So I played it cool. This better be worth it, I said, trying to be cool, trying to sound bored. He winked. Then he flapped his wings. On the show with the Kardashians, it always looks so messy when that happens, the sparks and debris and things catching fire. But he was delicate, though I don't want to suggest that he wasn't dragony because he totally was. <laughs> we took off over the rooftops. It had been spring back in New York, but it was still winter here in Chicago, ugly and bleak. But up here, everything was different. Bright and expansive and full of possibility, we swooped out over the city and then up the shore. The lights along Lake Michigan glinted like diamonds on a bracelet, but then after a while they stopped. Where did the lights go, I asked. Blame it on Wisconsin, he replied. <laughs> I wasn't sure what that meant. It had started to rain and the night was chilly, but against his warm scales, breathing in his smoky scent, I didn't notice. After a while, he asked me, are you hungry? I kind of was. He glided us down into a forest, gently depositing me onto a soggy patch of dirt. I have everything we need except for a porcupine quill, he said. Can you find one? OK. Were there porcupine, porcupines in Illinois? Or was it Wisconsin now? I started to hunt around, but I didn't really know what they looked like. I brought back a twig. He shook his head. I really would prefer a porcupine quill. Honestly, I don't understand your obsession with porcupines. <laughs> he lifted his wing and dropped a package of marshmallows, some graham crackers, a chocolate bar half melted. They make better skewers, he said. You're going to make me s'mores, I asked. He nodded. S'mores are my favorite, I said. I had a feeling. And that's when I had a feeling of my own, like maybe I'd been too quick to judge Chicago, other things. I wandered deep into the woods looking for a porcupine quill and found one, but it was attached to a porcupine. I tripped onto it and cut my leg. Ow, I yelled. The rain poured down my back as my blood dripped down my leg. I couldn't see a thing. It was pitch black. I was a Brooklyn girl deep in an Illinois or Wisconsin or maybe it was Indiana, forest with a dragon and a hedgehog wound. It was the kind of thing you have nightmares about. There was something about a spark. It ignited everything at once. It was him, the dragon, puffing the barest bit of flame to light the night. He looked at my leg. It resembled raw hamburger meat. <laughs> I smell like blood. What am I going to do? In the dim light, I could see him smirk. I'm not a vampire. The smell of blood does nothing for me. I was worried about the porcupine I fired back. I'm not scared of you. You're not? No. But why then was there a tremble in my voice? <laughs> even though I breathe fire, even though I'm a big bad dragon, I breathe fire too, I said, metaphorically. <laughs> he liked that, so I added. Also, after learning that my boyfriend cheated on me, his car went up in flames, literally. <laughs> he really liked that then I will make sure never to cheat on you, he said. You're being awfully presumptuous, I said. To cheat on me, you'd have to be my boyfriend. Dragon friend, he corrected. 
Have you ever dated a dragon before? No, I said. Do you know any dragons? No, I admitted. My leg was still bleeding. Can I take care of that for you, he asked. Yes, I said. And then gently, gently, with only the lightest spark, more of a laser, really, he cauterized the cuts on my leg. Then he roasted me a marshmallow and gave me a s'more. Then he kissed me. I'd been wrong about Dragon Beth. I'd been wrong about a lot of things. I looked up. I didn't realize how much my life had changed until I saw his face again. Let's go fly some more, I said. Where to, he asked. I don't know, I replied, but somehow the destination felt less important than the flying. Maybe this was all someone, else, someone else's imagination. Maybe there was a wish list fairy. Maybe I needed a different wish list. Maybe, maybe, this was how all great stories begin. <laughs>